Have you noticed that you can solve everyone else's problem but not your own? That is because emotion drives our understanding and common sense and replaces it with reason. Knowledge and intellect are often substitute for understanding and wisdom. Just as pleasure is a substitute for happiness, psychologists coined the word compensation to describe the attempt to replace a spiritual emptiness with the nearest physical equivalent. The feeling of fear, tension and desire to forget draws to the alcoholic the idea if I had a drink perhaps I'd feel better. Later on he says to himself perhaps if I had another one I would feel better still. The excessive smoker or eater are similar. They think with their feelings. Their feelings cause them to think. We all compensate for unpleasant feelings in millions of similar ifing ways. If I had someone to love me and understand me, if I had lots of money, when we cannot give love, we need love. When we cannot understand, we need understanding. It's very frustrating because no one has it to give us. Always we try to bring ourselves ease, relaxation and peace of mind through a material goal which is impossible. Nothing really satisfies. A man with an inferiority feeling may seek an education in the secret hope he will be superior. He has calculated that it's the lack of knowledge which makes him feel uncomfortable around people. Although he may gain much knowledge, he still has no understanding. The compulsive eater feels the same way, but he blames it all on his weight and thinks, perhaps if I could lose some of these pounds I'd feel more comfortable around people. Often, education, drink, overeating and smoking a compulsive attempts at symptom removal. The root of all our thinking lies in the emotions. The root of emotion lies in the reaction to conditions. For example, someone is rude to you. You react. You become angry. And your anger draws to it aggressive and negative thoughts. And your thoughts, in turn, cause you to feel, do or say things for which you're sorry for later, when the emotion has passed. In simpler terms, Emotion gives rise to thought. You're driving down the highway and someone cuts across in front of you and you think to yourself, you stupid so-and-so, one of these days I'd like to knock off your fenders. In a similar manner, daily irritations often keep alive and revive unpleasant memories which should have been long forgotten. If we destroy this emotion, the thoughts no longer have feeling or importance. Nobody but yourself can overcome your emotional problem. You have one because you allow anyone to trigger you emotionally, directing you through words and perhaps unkind actions. You must learn to control your own emotions. For the more you become emotionally upset, the less it takes to do this the next time. And the more the situation controls you, the less control you have over yourself. To overcome this, we need to learn two things. First, understanding just a little, because it will grow with use. Second, thought and emotion control, the ability to put this seed to work. If you cannot control your thoughts, you cannot control what you feel nor what you are. Example, the dreamer feels like he's falling in his sleep because of what he thinks. He's not really falling, but he feels like he is. He then reacts to what he feels by catching himself in his sleep. Surely we can feel guilt and fear in the same manner because of what we continually rehearse in our minds towards others. Another example. It's easy to make you angry by being rude, but if I told you beforehand I was going to do this as an experiment, you would be mentally armed for the experience. Here we can see that knowledge can prevent reaction and emotion. If we move into situations which normally upset us with such mental preparations, the conditions no longer have any effect upon our minds. This advanced knowledge procedure is the principle behind forgiving. To forgive means to forget. If you cannot forget, you cannot forgive. It is not what is forgotten which bothers you. It's what you compulsively remember. When you become annoyed, notice how you compulsively rehearse unpleasant words in your mind. By doing this, you create a good memory for the worthless things and a bad memory for the worthwhile, because what you wish to learn, you must repeat to yourself. 
This is also one reason why people who have experienced great aggravation become fearful of it happening again. The situation has caused anger, and the emotion gives life to the repetitious thoughts, which in turn creates the anticipation. Notice how emotion affects thought, and thought affects emotion. When we feel hungry, we think of food, but also, when we think of food, we can feel hungry. When we become upset, we are caused to think. This negative thought, in turn, causes us to feel. Now, because we feel badly, we begin to worry. The more we worry, the more we feel, which again affects our thoughts, and the complete cycle is fed again and again by anger. Normal man cannot control himself, although he pretends to. He will work himself to death so he won't feel the tension and keep away from the cause of his misery. He will wear himself out to feel tired enough to sleep. He also attempts to drown his thinking by distraction, excitement, watching TV all day long, tuning the radio as loud as possible. And because we cannot forgive, let's forget, we will bend over backwards to make people like us. Here we compensate for our inability to love. For as long as people are good, we can feel and think good towards others. We even boast about our weaknesses. We will give in to avoid argument and upset, and then call ourselves an easy-going guy. But we're still nervous volcanoes inside. Usually a nervous person is one who hides and suppresses his anger. To build it up and let it out on some trivial matter is quite useless because you say and do things for which you're sorry later. Man without understanding thinks without control. What he feels like doing is right, and what he doesn't feel like doing is wrong. We are driven by our self-made fear, anxiety, and excuses for our actions. Fear is the opposite to faith. We no longer want to do what's right, but become afraid of what's wrong. Because of this decreasing understanding, we create an increasing ability to analyze and rationalize we call worry. The more we seek into the past to find the answer to our problems, the more problems we create. The if goals we set up in our minds always fail to satisfy and now we become more confused than before. Therefore, the answer does not lie in knowledge. That is why it cannot be found. The secret lies in understanding, which can be obtained only by mental self-discipline and obedience to certain fundamental spiritual laws. In psychoanalysis, the analysis is first and the direction is second. In psychocatalysis, the direction and discipline is first and the understanding is second because understanding comes best by experience. The Hebrew word for commandment literally means to point the way or signpost. It implies if the instruction is obeyed or followed, it would lead to more understanding. It is foolhardy to learn to swim while drowning. One would be wise to learn in shallow water in a spare time. Likewise, if we cannot control our reactions and emotions in our leisure, we can hardly be prepared for emergency. The mental exercise we teach does two things. First, we learn thought control, which means to forget or remember at will. For example, to remember to forget is accomplished when you forgive or make allowances for someone who's trying to annoy you. At the same moment, we destroy the bodily response to the situation, gaining a measure of control from within ourselves. Second, we learn as part of the mental exercise to control feeling. A pianist cannot learn by thinking alone. He must have a desire to practice. It is difficult to change ourselves reluctantly. The man who lends his lawnmower reluctantly does so only with his movement, but not with his mind and feeling. In a like manner, many people forgive reluctantly, doing so only in appearance, but not in feeling and thought. Your reaction to hearing this might be, I don't get mad, I love everyone. But remember, just because you do not show your anger doesn't mean to say you're not annoyed. Being kind with your actions is not what I'm talking about. Basically, the second commandment says, Love thy neighbor as thyself. The way you feel towards others is the way we feel in ourselves. If you love someone, you feel the love. And if you hate, well then you feel hate by getting mad with yourself. The perfectionist is far from perfect. He cannot make allowances for others so he cannot make allowances for himself. 
he criticizes others, so he feels like others are criticizing him. Thus, only when we are able to overlook the faults of others do we eliminate our own. Anger is a producer of fault. Forgiving is the opposite, is the fault reducer. So when you can say, I have no fault, then you can say, I have no anger. No idea is lasting, whether it be positive or negative. It must have emotional energy to keep it alive. The negative, morbid thoughts are created and kept alive through the daily feeding of the emotion of anger. The nervous businessman who takes a trip leaves a source of his aggravation behind. Soon he begins to feel better, but when he returns he becomes depressed again. Granted, getting away from the problem helps temporarily, but it's not the real answer. Therefore, the exercise is tremendously important, for it creates emotional energy so that we may keep alive positive thought without depending on conditions to do it for us. We learn in this manner to respond to our own understanding with emotion and feeling, doing more and more what we know and realize is wise and responding less and less to conditions and situations. In other words, we don't need a condition to be good to feel happy. We can feel happy regardless of the situation. Better still, the situation doesn't control you. You have control over the situation. The exercise meditation destroys the angry response which is the cause of most of our negative thinking. The person who returns anger for anger and love for love is merely reflecting and mimicking the world around him. Anyone can be kind to those who are kind to them and angry at those who are rude to them. As long as you act this way, you cannot be an individual in your thinking because you depend on conditions to be good so that you can think good. Before each lesson, listen to me again and take special note of the following. You may not understand now, but tomorrow or the next day you will. Animals respond to danger with anger, which takes one of two forms, either to run or to fight. When we become annoyed or irritated at some trivial thing and say and do nothing, we create the accumulating alternative to run. That is called fear. Because you do not know why you feel this way, you may seek to identify it with something. This is why we are often afraid of many things without apparent reason, like storms, driving a car, failure of any kind, yes, even crowds, because it's people who cause the anger in the beginning. Most guilt feelings are artificial. Your anger makes you compulsively think of little retaliations towards those who wrong you from day to day, like what we should have said, what we could have done. Your thoughts can make you feel guilty, just like the dreamer who feels like he's falling in his sleep but isn't. Now, if you search into your past, to find what makes you feel this way, you will find the wrong reason. Now either you can't forgive yourself, or you blame someone unfairly, which makes you irritated again, which in turn makes you feel more guilty. Guilt can be falsely identified in thousands of subtle variations, like, I feel guilty for not doing more for my children, or my husband or wife before they passed away, unable to pay my debts, not being able to work more, I feel guilty about sex, how I treated my mother and father, etc. Honest individuals who feel this way may seek to make up for it. They will give everything to their kids and they won't discipline them. They can't say no to requests and they spend all their time doing things for people instead of themselves and the ones they love. Resentment and anger creates an act of suppression which eventually becomes a conditioned reflex. Sooner or later we are suppressing more than we're expressing. Anger sweeps away sensible disagreements with a flood of emotion which we cannot possibly express. So we say nothing, walk away or cry. On occasions we will blow up when we can no longer control ourselves. When the balance is reached, where we are suppressing more than we are expressing, we will have to push ourselves to work. Because anger is thinking without doing, we find it difficult to make decisions for ourselves. And we depend on others to do it for us. In our insecurity, we develop a need for people, which we foolishly call love. When they do well, we depend upon them more. But if they make mistakes, we resent them more, which adds to the cycle of angry emotion. Now, because we think and don't do, we procrastinate. We worry about what we haven't done and what we have to do, which is increasingly difficult. But worry is thought, and whatever is important in our thoughts become more and more difficult and even frustrating because anger colors our thoughts in a negative manner. We will sit daydreaming, 
and may find it difficult to concentrate with millions of things in our mind. We can read a whole page of newspaper and not know a single word on it when we finished. We follow the writing only with our eyes but not our understanding. By the way, this is one reason why children fail in school. Each time we allow ourselves to become annoyed, we must follow through with the chain reaction of thinking and emotion, and each day it grows into a giant negative tree. Anger is the father of our complexities and confusion, but unless you've done the exercise on the other side of this recording, you may not understand this. Positive thinking and well-being is a present you cannot give yourself. It comes as a gift from God for remembering to make allowances for your fellow man.